Welcome to today's episode of Storytime. Okay, so last time we talked about how Rome was founded. Today we're going to talk about the reign of Rome's first king, Romulus. I wanted to go ahead and give you some names so that you can jot those down, get the spelling right. Uh, Pronunciation-wise, of course in Latin this would be Titus Tatius. Sometimes we call him Titus Tatius or Titus Tatius is some how other people pronounce it. I kind of like Titus Tatius. I don't know, something about like the Tat Man. Anyway, he's the king of a group of people called the Sabines. And then uh, this woman will factor into our story today as well. Her name is pronounced Tarpeia, and that's how you spell it. And these terms as well, patricians and plebeians. All right, so to review from last time, you guys remember April 21st, 753 BCE, Romulus murdered his brother Remus and thus founded the city of Rome. Notice how there's a bunch of like dudes in the background. So we now have a city, Romulus is our king, and they've built a wall because it's the first thing you always have to do in ancient times is build that wall to protect your people, right? So then the issue becomes this. Uh, all right, how do we get people to come to our city? So Romulus starts this uh, public relations campaign and he sends messengers to all the surrounding towns and cities and through the forests as well, anybody that they can see. And basically here's the message. It goes like this. Here's the sales pitch. Have you been kicked out of your city? Does no one like you? Have you been convicted of murder but are on the run? Are you a thief? And nobody wants anything to do with you. If so, then come on down to this brand new city called Rome. We won't ask any questions. We promise. So after this PR campaign goes out, uh, then all of a sudden Rome has like hundreds of people. But there's a problem. They're all dudes. Every single one. A man. And so then Rome has to figure out how are we going to get women? And this part, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, is awful. Just awful. And if we had a chance to talk about this in class, uh, if it were not for the coronavirus, I know that we would have a very illuminating discussion about why in the world a culture would celebrate what I'm about to tell you. And we would probably make all kinds of connections to today's time. Uh, But since we can't meet face to face, I just have to tell you this and just show you uh, the slides and tell you what this this next act is called in Roman history. It was called it by the ancient historians. It's still called it by the modern historians as well. So here's what happens. It's not pretty. So Rome sends out an invitation to all the towns that surrounded uh, after they you know have their men and they say, hey, uh, we're throwing ourselves. We're this new city called Rome. We're throwing ourselves a huge, huge like we're a brand new city party. So come on down. Eh, we'll have a big feast. We'll have lots of wine. It's going to be great. Bring your women. And every single town, to their credit, says, oh, heck no. Rome? Isn't that that new upstart town where we sent all the people that we didn't want? Yeah, no thanks. Except there's this one group of people, the Sabines, and their king, Titus Tatius, the Tat Man, and they decide, oh, okay, fine. We're game. We'll come. So the Sabines show up, they bring their women, and this is all a big trick that the Romans are playing. It's just a huge ruse. And basically, the Romans get the Sabine men really drunk, the Romans pretend to get drunk, and then, at just the right moment, Romulus gives a sign. Here's Romulus up here. He gives a sign. Some Roman men take out their swords and chase the Sabine men out of the city while other Roman men grab the Sabine women. And this episode in Roman history, as I've told you, this is still what it's called today. It is referred to as the rape of the Sabine women. It's awful. Okay, you can just imagine how traumatized these women must be. And again, what does it say about a culture that they sort of like celebrated this as their origin story? I mean, of course, they also had a, a king who murdered his brother. Um, so there's all kinds of layers of, of problems with these early stories and these myths that the Romans like to tell. So uh, the, the men have been driven out. The Sabine men have been driven out um, and the Sabine women have been taken um, and they have been raped by the Roman men and most of them become pregnant. Now, Titus Tatius, the Tat Man, here he is. He and the Sabines, you think they're going to give up that easily? Oh, heck no. They go back to Sabine town and they start training because they're going to come back and get their women and get revenge upon the Romans. 
Now, for some strange reason, please don't apply logic to story time, it takes them exactly like 9 to 10 months for them to finally get their army and their act together. And of course, by the time they come back, most of the women, the Sabine women, have given birth to little babies, which are half Sabine, half Roman. Tuck that in the back of your head. Now, as the Sabines come uh, under Titus Tadius, they try, they basically like drive the Romans into their city, and the Romans are fortified in the city, and uh, Titus Tadius and the Sabines are looking for a way to get in. They cannot find a way into the city. Well, one uh, day, some soldiers come across a woman named Tarpeia, and Tarpeia is, of course, one of the Sabine women who was taken against her will. She is outside the city walls getting water at a well. And the Sabine men look at her and they're like, oh, oh hey, we know you. You're, you're one of us. Uh, your name's Tarpeia. How did you get out of the city? And she says, oh, well, there's a secret back door. And they're like, well, show us where the back door is because we're here to rescue you. Like, we want to we want to take the Romans by surprise and get all the women back. And Tarpeia says, oh, okay, it'll cost you. And the Sabine men look at her and say, what are you talking about? Like, you're one of us. What do you mean it'll cost us? Come on, just show us. She says, no, I'll do it if you give me what's on your left arms. Sabine men, it was their, uh, their custom uh, that they would wear these golden bracelets all up and down their left arms, basically from the elbow to the shoulder, these golden bands. And so the Sabine men said, fine, yes, we'll give you what's on our left arms. Show us where the back door is. And so she leads them to the back door. And then she says, okay, show me what's on your left arms. And then they proceed to beat her to death with their shields. You see, they upheld their end of the bargain, for they also wore their shields on their left arm. So they really did give her what was on their left arms, crushed her to death. Now, Tarpeia is known as Rome's first traitor, even though she wasn't even Roman, she was Sabine. And even though uh, it's really hard to call it being a traitor when you're like showing your own people a way to get into the city to rescue you and your other folks back. But anyway, um, they named, the Romans did, they, they named a, a rock on the very top, the highest point of Rome. It's called the Capitoline Hill. And on the Capitoline Hill, there was a rock. And that rock they called the Tarpeian Rock. And from that point forward, whenever Rome had a traitor on their hands, that person would be taken to the Tarpeian Rock, the highest point in Rome. It was basically like the edge of a cliff and pushed off where they would fall to their doom. Anyway, the Sabines come into the city, although, hello, could they not have noticed? I mean, is that really a secret back door? Good Lord, it's just like a door in the wall. But anyway, they go inside, don't apply logic, and they take the Romans by surprise, and there's a huge fight, and Romans and Sabines are slaughtering each other. And so how is this going to end? Well, a very famous painting right here done by a French painter who lived during the French Revolution named Jacques-Louis David. That's last name is spelled D-A-V-I-D, -D, like David. You should look up some of his other paintings. You will see many of them in this class. Uh, boom, here's what happens. Wow, look at this painting. When you guys go to the Louvre in Paris, you will see this painting. It takes up basically like an entire wall. And uh, what's really creepy is that this baby right here, there's always random babies in these paintings, but anyway, this baby in particular, he's looking right at you. It's terrifying. The Sabine women go into the middle of the battlefield and they hold up their babies Simba style, and they show the babies to both the Sabines and the Romans, and they basically say to the Sabine men, they're like, look, what happened to us was awful, but we now have these children, and we want these children to grow up with fathers. We also want them to grow up with grandfathers and uncles, and they say the same thing to the Romans, and the Sabine women are able to convince the Romans and the Sabine men to stop fighting. Now, there's all kinds of issues with this story, uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, reality, I guess we could say. But the Romans themselves, this is what story time's all about. It's how the Romans told themselves their own history, as interpreted by me, of course. But uh, they told themselves this story, and they said that the Sabine women basically convinced the men to stop fighting, and that Sabines and Romans then joined together as one group of people. And most of the Sabine men came to the town. Now, where they got women, I don't know. What happened to the women? Did they become the Romans' wives? Did they become, they still stay the wives of the Sabine men? Those are lots of unanswered questions, which uh, are frustrating that we don't have the answers to. 
but uh, King Titus Tadius therefore becomes co-king with Romulus. So for a while, Rome has two kings, Romulus and Titus Tadius. Now, if you'll recall, the whole thing about Romulus versus Remus, his twin brother, is that a, a city cannot have two kings. It's just impossible. You, you, you can only have one. And so do we think that this whole co-kingship thing is going to last? No, of course not. By the way, here's the Tarpeian Rock. See it right there? So traders go, ah, whoosh, splat. All right. So the Save My Women Save the Day. Now, um, this whole co-king thing uh, doesn't last very long. A couple of years into it, Titus Tadius goes on a diplomatic mission to another city, and he never comes back. And, uh, you know, the ambassadors who went with him, they came back to Rome and they reported, yeah, he got really sick and died. It was very sudden. Uh, <laughs> poisoned! <laughs> by Romulus, most likely. So Romulus is, you know, king again. Now, what did Romulus do exactly besides founding the city and, you know, building a whole bunch of its important structures, or at least the initial uh, parts of those structures? Well, one thing that he did was he gathered a hundred old men together, literally a hundred old men, senes, together uh, to advise him. And those senes became known as senator, senatores, the senate was formed. And this was uh, an important distinction for Romans. If you as a Roman could trace your ancestry back to those 100 original senators that Romulus picked, those 100 old men, then you were known as a patrician. And that was sort of like an aristocratic uh, title, I guess. Um, most patricians were extremely wealthy, well-connected. Um, and they continued to be in politics uh, year, generation after generation after generation. If you could not trace your ancestry back to one of those 100 original senators, as of course most Romans could not, then you were known as plebeians. And these two classes of people, the patricians and the plebeians, you're going to find out, end up fighting with each other quite a bit. Um, the plebeians tended to be poorer citizens, as you can imagine, and they would, would fight for their own rights. And that's really more story time for, for later on down the road next year. But let's get back to this. So you've got the patricians, you've got the plebeians, we're good to go. Now, Romulus rules for a long time. Romulus actually has no sons, which is kind of a problem. If you're going to be king, you need an heir, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about how Romulus dies. There's a couple of different stories, two stories actually, and the stories start off exactly the same, but then they diverge at a critical point. So here's how they both start. One day, Romulus is kind of getting up there in age. He is surveying his troops. They're all lined up. And of course, Romulus, think about it, you know, the fact that uh, there was bloodshed to start the city. There was a violent act in getting its women. Uh, all throughout Romulus's reign, Rome was always like fighting off little neighboring tribes. And so the army was always ready to go and, and raring for a fight. And Romulus really delighted in uh, making sure that his troops were, were at their best. And so he's, he's got the troops lined up, he's doing an inspection, uh, and he's sitting in his throne. Well, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a massive hailstorm comes down and everybody goes running and seeks shelter wherever they can. And now here's where the stories diverge. Here's story number one, the story that the Romans like to tell themselves in public. Here it is. And then a massive cloud descended from the sky, wrapped itself around Romulus as he was sitting in his chair, and carried him up to the heavens where he died, but really then became immortal and became a god. Dun, dun, dun. And when the Romans came out, after the storm, they saw nothing but an empty throne, and of course it must mean that he became a god. Now, of course, the Romans would then say, but here's what really happened. The Romans themselves would admit in private that the second story was probably more likely, although, again, it's story time, so who knows if any of this stuff really happened anyway. But the second story goes like this. Hailstorm erupts. People go running. Romulus, though, is kind of old and can't get out of his throne very easily. There are a couple of senators who are standing by, getting pelted with hail, of course, who are willing to help him. But do they help him? Oh, no. Oh, no. 
Now, what do all kings fear? They fear assassination. And sure enough, we've got a couple of senators who don't like Romulus for whatever reason. And they take out some, some daggers and swords and whatnot. And they stab, stab, stab him to death. And they chop up his body into little pieces. And then the hailstorm is so violent that it washes all the body parts away. So that when the Romans come out later from their homes and shelters, after the hailstorm is over, all they see, boom, is an empty throne. And so, of course, they assume that Romulus just must have ascended to heaven. Wow. Romulus murdered. No male heirs. What is the Senate going to do? That's next time on Storytime.